Good afternoon, Pork Fest. Is anybody excited about this talk? Pork Fest is thrilled, I mean thrilled, to have Tom Woods back this year. Tom is the, is, is the host of the Tom Woods Show, which has nearly 2,000 episodes. Anybody going to Tom Woods' uh, 2,000 episode? Hell yeah, yeah. If you don't go, sign up. Uh, it's going to be a blast. Um, Tom's also a two-time best-selling author, has, read, uh, has written 12 books. He, he also has been an absolute hero on the COVID tyranny. There's nobody that has been better on COVID tyranny than Tom Woods. So, Park Fest, please give your best applause for the great, the heroic Tom Woods. Wow, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Well, and to think there was a time when I thought, I don't think I'd really fit in at Porkfest. <laughs> That's just not true. Everybody has a place here at Porkfest. Isn't that so? We all have a place. We all find a niche here. Last year was the first one of these I came to. I better keep an eye on the clock here. Last one of these was the first, first one I came to, and I decided to, to attend last year because it was a libertarian event that had not been canceled. So I thought, in principle, I have to support these people. And what, geez, what a time I had. So I thought, yeah, 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 I'll come again. So we've had, we've had a great time here already. All right, I do want to say a few quick things before I get started about other things that I'm doing here. So I got the dates wrong on one of them. I thought one of them was tomorrow, it was today, and I ate my lunch right through the event. So that was completely my fault. Yeah, and I'm not even under the influence of anything. I can't even blame that. But my old friend, John Bush, I've known John Bush since the 2008 Ron Paul campaign. My gosh, that guy works like 10 people. And he's doing, he's in the first row of uh, Agora Valley up here. He's in, in uh, lot 20, and he's got an event going just for hours on end on how to be successful in, in life and in your career and in activism. And for some reason, he's got me doing a thing on that. So I told, I, oh, I, can't, I can't believe I forgot. So I'm going to join that event at ha, 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 420. At 420, I'm going to be in lot 20. All right, that's the first thing I want to tell you. Second thing is um, tomorrow I have a little event in the Anthem Theater at 3 p.m. on how to be an effective public speaker. So if I do a really shitty job today, no one will want to go to that. So I'm hoping that my little informal talk among friends will inspire you to come to that. And it will not be useless platitudes like, be confident. Well, yeah, if it was that easy, of course I'd be confident. If I could just push a button, or it won't be anything like, get up early in the morning and exercise. No, no, no. It'll be specific things you can do, not only to be an effective speaker, but also I'm going to talk about how you write your speech, how do you prepare it. Not that you write it out word for word and read it to people. Oh, no. No, no, no. No, no. No, that is lesson one. We're not doing that. But I'm going to talk to you about how I do it, because I have a model that I follow. No one seems to have caught on to it or figured it out or cracked the code, but I'm going to tell you exactly. And it, and it serves me really well, so I'm going to reveal all that tomorrow. Then also tomorrow, it's Soapbox Idol. Is that at 6 p.m., Carla? All right, so I'm one of the judges at Soapbox Idol, right here, and it's so fun. But then I'm kind of supposed to be in two places at once, because at 7, they're doing a screening of a documentary I consulted on called The Bubble, or The Housing Bubble, up in the Anthem Theater, and they're doing a Q&A panel afterward. Uh, so I'll be immediately after the Soapbox Idol, I'll be rushing up to the Anthem Theater to be on that Q&A panel. But since Gene Epstein will also be on the Q&A panel, you wouldn't even notice if I didn't ever make it up there because of, you know, motor mouth Gene. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> by the way, poor Gene's been abused this entire time so far. <laughs> All right, let's see. So far, 2021's been kind of a mixed bag. I mean, 2020 was pretty clearly just the shits. But 2021's been a little bit of a mixed bag for me because I started, I started off the year where I severely injured one of my arms because I took a fall at home. 
Now, when you hear a man took a fall at home, you think, what is this guy, 87? <laughs> nobody, nobody takes a fall at home. What the hell is this? I don't, it's too embarrassing for me to relate to exactly what happened, but it was a, it was a really bad, bad injury. Then I had, I had a, I suffered a very, very debilitating back injury. What the hell? What am I aging 20 years in five seconds? I ate 20. Give me the friggin' pandemic back. What the hell is this? And then, then now, right under here, right under my shirt right here, I'm not going to pull it up, but just take my word for it. There's a big bandage here because it was found that I had some precancerous material right here that had to be removed. So they had to yank out a big chunk of me and so it's now stitched together and healing. <sighs> I'm still around, but man, it's been a struggle these past few months. However, there's been one bit of very good news in 2021 so far, and that is that I got engaged to this wonderful woman, Jenna, right here. And I, I have not disclosed this to the world. I've not disclosed this to the world. This is absolutely true. My best man is Michael Malice. Oh, don't you wish you had an invite to that event. Well, I'll tell you, you probably can't come to the wedding. But what you can come to is the 2000th episode of the Tom Woods Show in Orlando, October 16th. That night is going to be a night of entertainment and hilarity because Malice will be there too. And Malice says he's bringing a special surprise guest. I haven't been told who it is. I don't know how he gets away with this shit. You know, I'm just going to do some crazy surprise thing and you just have to live with it. And, and yet we all accept this from him somehow for some reason. But he says when people see who this special surprise guest is, they're going to need oxygen masks to recover. Like that's how much it's going to affect them. So I got that. I got a bunch of fun. I have a lot of folks who are well known from being uh, frequent guests on my show. I have several surprise secret guests, secret guests I do know about that I'll be revealing uh, on that night. But also just as if to emphasize the diversity of talents in our world, there's a fellow who was on the television show that Penn and Teller have. Now, I bet a lot of us are fans of the magicians Penn and Teller. Now, I find that fewer than half of those people know that Penn and Teller have a TV show. But it's an excellent show. It's called Fool Us. And the idea is you're a magician. You have to do a trick in front of Penn and Teller that they can't figure out. And it's wonderful to watch this because they're so brilliant. You watch these unbelievable tricks. You think, there's no way they know how that's done. They know how it's done. Well, this guy, Doc Dixon, fooled them, and it turns out he's one of my listeners, and he reads my newsletter. So I had him on the show. Yeah, he's a libertarian, but I almost didn't even care. Tell me what it's like to be on Penn & Teller's TV show. So then he found out I'm doing the 2000th episode, and he said, how would you like me to saw you in half at your 2000th episode? <laughs> so yeah, that's happening, by the way. That is going to happen. But it's not the usual saw in half, you know, where it's a box and it's split in half. And we know that the guy is squished into one of the two boxes. He said, no, 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 it's a different routine. It, it involves a chainsaw. And he said, by the way, how surprised do you want to be during this routine? And I'm rolling the dice and saying, very surprised. So we're going to have a lot of fun. So if you want to attend that, this event, by the way, which is costing me a fortune, <laughs> This event is my gift to the listeners. So it does not cost you one cent to get in. All you got to do is just register at TomWoods2000.com. Not TomWoods.com slash 2000. TomWoods2000.com. It's going to be a lot of fun. All right, now let's, now let's get in, into this. All right, you know, I could talk about almost anything. But over the course of 2020, there was just one topic I couldn't shut my mouth about. I just couldn't stop because I couldn't believe the sheer irrationality of what I was living through and what we all lived through. And I have to say, at the same time, by the same token, I'm equally surprised at how quickly some of it is, has melted away. Yes, it took a long time to get here, but it's almost as if instantaneously masks start, started coming off. I, I visited Massachusetts for several days before this. Oh, good, okay. In the past, sometimes I say Massachusetts, people hiss. Okay, good. There we go, now I feel more at home. And I was expecting everybody to have two masks and a face shield, and that was not the case. So that, that's, that's wonderful, that's great. 
So I wrote an awful lot about this, and I did a lot of podcast episodes about it. And initially, when the thing hit in March of 2020, I, I thought, well, I don't really know what's going to happen here, and maybe I shouldn't go to this event or that event. And I had nothing to worry about. All those events were canceled, so I had nothing to worry about. I didn't go to them. But now we've had all these months, over a year, to go back and look at the numbers, look at the results, look at the outcome. What actually happened in the different places where measures of varying severity were implemented? Is there any discernible effect of any of this? And it doesn't look like there is. You can graph the results by lockdown stringency or by mask mandate dates or by social mobility, because we can actually track are people moving around or not? And the results are entirely random, and that shouldn't be. It's, they should not be random. If these alleged mitigation measures work the way we were told, it should be dramatically obvious, just from looking at the numbers, which places did what. And that's not so. Now, by the way, when you talk about mask mandates, people say that's not legitimate to look at mask mandates, because sometimes people wear masks even without the mandate. So it doesn't really measure anything. But I'll tell you something. We were in Charleston, South Carolina, right at the very moment that they removed their outdoor mask mandate. We were there during that time. We were there when they had it, and then we were there the next day when they didn't have it. And in one day, boom, at least half the masks came off. So don't tell me that the mandates don't do They do make people do things. And we can't seem to see any, any real result of all this. Now, I want to get a little bit of the bad news out of the way, right? Because this is, this is a fun time. Like, nobody wants to be depressed at Porkfest. And if you are, we have many, many chemical ways of getting you out of it. <laughs> but I will say just very briefly, I mean, I, I try to be magnanimous in victory, but there were some libertarians, people in our own world, who were not good on this issue. And that is absolutely mind-boggling to me. I am flabbergasted at that, that people in the libertarian world were not good on this or were telling us that if we don't listen to Dr. Fauci, we're cranks because don't you know he's the recognized expert? I don't know how somebody with that kind of mentality ever became a libertarian because every expert in the world tells you not to be a libertarian. Every expert in the world tells you you need central direction of your life, your money, everything. You can't have Bitcoin. You should have the U.S. dollar because the experts are in charge of it. I don't know how those people became libertarians. Or we had libertarians who just didn't say anything one way or the other about the lockdowns. Oh, sure, we heard all through 2020 how against civil asset forfeiture they were. Well, that's awesome. Like, wow. Wow, you're against civil asset forfeiture. What stones it must have taken to say that in 2020. Meanwhile, we're, I'm stuck in my house. I would almost be happy if somebody seized one of my assets because that would at least mean I had gotten to go out somewhere, for heaven's sake. <laughs> so we had that. But the same people who were silent on the issue of our time, silent, these are the same people who, whom you never hear mentioning Austrian economics. Because you see, that's crankish too. The mainstream is not Austrian. And it's very important that we, not see, that we have to seem respectable, so we don't hear that. Or our call to end the Fed, they ridicule end the Fed. That's not respectable. Ah, I think this is a problem. I think this is a divider between us. I don't care if people like Fauci or any of these others consider me respectable or not. That's not what I'm going for, and it's not what we should be going for. As a matter of fact, a couple of days ago, I had an opportunity to have lunch with, let's just say, an infectious disease epidemiologist at an extremely elite medical school, okay? You can probably guess which one it is. So I had lunch with this guy, and now here he is, this unbelievable genius. Like, he's such a genius. I don't even understand what he does. I, I'm not even smart enough to know what it is that he does. We're having this lunch, and he says, by the way, I want to tell you that the work and the videos and the presentations that you've done have been so important, so based in science, so effective and full of humor. He says, but you know what? Forget all that. The most important thing you did, the most important thing, and this is an extremely credentialed academic at probably the most elite medical school in the US, if not the world, said the most important thing I had done 
was to ridicule Fauci, to ridicule him. He says people like Fauci need to be ridiculed. <laughs> Let's remember, as the spring and summer and then early autumn of 2020 were going by, Fauci was asked, by the way, have you factored into any of your policy recommendations all the obvious and debilitating collateral damages caused by these lockdowns you advocate? And his answer was no, he hadn't. And nobody in the American media thinks to ask questions like this of epidemiologists. In your modeling, are you factoring in the collateral damages of your policies? The most obvious question of all doesn't occur to any of them to ask. You know, but, if, but if Fauci you know, gets a new dog, oh, they want to know all about what the dog's name is and all, all that. All right, so that occupied a lot of my time. And as I say, I found that you just don't see many differences. So I decided to come up with a little quiz because I have a lot of charts that I've been distributing. And these charts will show here's the case or death numbers for such and such country. Where do you think masks became widely used? Just take a guess looking at the, like, do you think it's the, the numbers went up here and then we started using masks and then they came down? Like, where do you think? Pin the mask mandate on the country. You can't. It's completely random in each case, whether we're talking about Austria, Spain, Italy, the UK, Germany, uh, anywhere. Uh, you, you don't know where. You cannot tell. Or if I say to you, all right, here is a graph of the death numbers or hospitalization numbers in all the Midwestern states. Now, one of these states has opened up completely, but I'm not going to tell you which of these lines it is because I'm sure you can figure it out because all the mitigation measures did so much good that if one state opened up, I'm sure their numbers must be way up here, right? So it'll be really easy for you to pick out which one of these lines is Iowa, right? Of course, you can't because all the lines are identical. I hate to have to say you wasted a year or a year and a half of your life if you went along with this, but you did. If you can't pick out Iowa on that graph, that means none of it mattered. Or if you can't pin Thanksgiving on the Midwest, because Thanksgiving, right, we're all going to die because we're all evil people who want to have Thanksgiving with our grandmothers or whatever it is, we should be able to see Thanksgiving on a chart of the Midwestern states, right? It should be obvious that that's when the big spike occurs, right after Thanksgiving. So I have a little quiz, pin Thanksgiving on the Midwest. Go ahead, show me on this chart where you think Thanksgiving is. It is not at all where you think it is. So what the hell is going on here? So, with my friend, is Tim Scott in here? Tim Scott right here did the legwork. <laughs> Tim Scott did the legwork for my COVID charts quiz, which you should go look at later. It's COVID charts with an S quiz.com. And the beauty of this quiz is you get a zero on it every time. You know, which state did X and which did Y? You have no idea. <laughs> no idea. You can't tell at all. So now on Twitter, I just answer with that. People saying, well, you have to behave unselfishly because blah, 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 blah. Okay, go ahead. Take the quiz then. If this bullshit works, it should be obvious from the quiz answers. And it's not. Oh, this makes me so happy to design a quiz nobody can score above a zero on. It's so satisfying. And then meanwhile, what did we have to live through? The most ridiculous, over-the-top mainstream media headlines of all time. I remember when Georgia opened up this much in late April. They started to allow indoor dining. Now, even Florida... <laughs> I don't even have a comeback for that. That's good. Even Florida closed indoor dining. We forget that Florida did go along with some of this for a while. Well, look, I enjoy eating at restaurants. I do. I love that. That's, I, I do. I know, and Carla, I know, I could save money and enjoy myself more if I ate it. I know that. I know. But it's just not going to happen. I'll tell you, okay, I like other people preparing my food. And I don't like cleaning up, whatever. So I'm dying in Florida at this point. I'm dying. And it's like April 27th. So Jen and I, of course, said, we're going to Georgia for a while. <laughs> so up we went. Up we went to Georgia. And we went, we, I remember we went to Morton's Steakhouse because it was one of the few restaurants that was open. And, and there were just a few people in there. And we're all kind of looking at each other like, I'm not sure we're supposed to be doing this shit, but we're doing it. 
the first opportunity we went up there. I didn't know anything. To this day, I knew nothing about Governor Kemp at all. I don't know a thing about him, but I was toasting that bastard during that meal. <laughs> and you know that it's taken a toll on old Woods if he's toasting a politician, for crying out loud. <laughs> so we did that. What, what was the mainstream media response? Well, between the Atlantic and the Washington Post, we got Georgia is attempting to become an experiment in human sacrifice. And Georgia is aiming to become the number one death destination in America. Now, needless to say, neither of these things occurred, but no apologies were for You think these people apologize? And then Iowa. Iowa was referred, but Iowa's doing great. Iowa was called the state that doesn't care if you live or die. That headline comes out, and the numbers, almost like they planned it, the numbers shoot way down immediately after that headline. The state that doesn't care if you live or die. The state you can't even pick out on the graph, it turns out. All this crazy gaslighting stuff. Now, of course, you know I live in Florida, and that's where we're having the 2000th episode. And the place where I got, where I reserved the 2000th episode, it's a beautiful resort. Uh, it's, you're just going to love it. I, I hope you'll, you'll be able to be there. But the guy who owns the property had this big video on the front page saying, masks are the most important weapon we have against the... Oh, no. Man, I am trying to get people to go to this. <laughs> not, to, not to graffiti your property. Come on, you're not helping me here. I was there about a month ago. They said, nobody's wearing a mask anymore. And this, that video is probably still up. <laughs> Nobody, it, we've just moved right on past it. But Florida was, in my part of Florida, was pretty masked up until quite recently. But Florida has been like the control group in the U.S. because since September of 2020, there have been no state-imposed occupancy restrictions at all. So, you know, I've gone, to, I've gone to see plays in theaters. I've gone to a comedy show. By the way, by the way, you might not like Rob Schneider's movies, but doggone it, if you see Rob Schneider's coming to your town doing comedy, you got to go. He did a routine that was... 60% of it was anti-lockdown, and it was hysterical. And normally I kind of want my politics kept out of my comedy, but no, remember the principle, these people need to be ridiculed. And man, does he do a masterful job at it. It is so, he is so fantastic. All right, so Florida, you know, we have sort of normal life, and our death rate is 1,750 per million. Okay, so what do you compare that to? All right, well, California has a death rate of about 1,600 per million. So they say, oh, I guess California is doing marginally better. But remember, Florida has the fifth oldest population in the country. California has the 44th oldest. So you adjust for that, and if anything, Florida's doing marginally better. And meanwhile, California ruined your life. They just flat out ruined it. Everything closed irrationally. Things that have nothing to do with anything. I remember they even had... You, you think, okay, maybe I can go to a drive-in movie. A drive-in movie. Okay, you could. You could go to a drive-in movie, but because of local health regulations, the drive-in movies were not allowed to have double features. <laughs> because the virus loves a double feature. <laughs> like, it'll sit through Godzilla, but if it's like King Kong versus Godzilla, then it's saying enough's enough. What does any of this have to do? So the general principle was, anything people love, we're just going to cancel that. It doesn't matter what the science is, we're just going to cancel it. And anything that would make people's lives miserable, we're going to mandate that. That was, the, that was apparently the, the ruling principle. So they did all this. Then they, then they reopened Disneyland, the only Disney property anywhere in the world that was still closed all these months later. They reopened it at 10%, and with the rule that you're, this is not a joke, you're not allowed to scream on the rides. All right, let me tell you something here. When old Manly Woods screams on a ride, it's not voluntary, okay? It just happens. Can't control that. So, so finally, finally, somebody got up the stones to ask one of these lockdown maniacs to account for this. And it was old Andy Slavitt. Andy Slavitt who never learns a thing. He's wrong about everything, never learns a thing. He's on MSNBC and they say... Why do you think it is that California was like totally locked down and Florida's not at all? And yet they're 
indistinguishable in their results. Why do you think that is? And his answer was, well, there are some things about this virus that are just a little bit beyond our ability to understand. <laughs> and by the way, that's all I wanted them to say all along, just to admit we don't fully get what's going on here because if we did, these results wouldn't be occurring. So he admits that he doesn't even get that. But then he says, but we all know what works, social distancing and whatever. But wait, wait a minute, I'm not sure we do because you just said you don't get why that's happening. And then Michael Osterholm also has, has 10% honesty. Osterholm, is a, he was a Biden advisor on COVID. He's an expert on influenza. 40 years he's been studying it. So initially on the mask thing, he said, all right, well, virtually all the masks people are wearing is totally pointless because he says it's, anything you would breathe is just going right through the holes on the side. He said it's, it's like saying I'm going to keep stuff out of my submarine by closing three out of the five windows doesn't do a thing. So he said that. But the other thing he said recently, and I can't find it. He said it, and now I can't track it down. But I swear to you, he said it. He was saying, look, let's face it. There is no good explanation for why Iowa should be doing so well and Michigan so badly, with Michigan so heavily locked down. He admitted it. He said there is no good explanation. And if somebody tries to, because usually when you bring up comparisons like this on Twitter, well, all the infectious disease epidemiologists that you know on Twitter uh, who suddenly have opinions on this, they'll all come up with something. Oh, well, there's nuance here, and you're forgetting to factor in this. Osterholm says, forget all, take all that, roll it up in a ball, and throw it away. We have no good explanation for why we have these different results. And anyone who says that he does is a liar. Again, that's all I was asking them to say. We don't fully know what's going on here. Maybe we're ruining people's lives for no reason. And then, not Florida, but Texas was the subject of a question to Dr. Fauci. All right, Fauci, everybody said if Texas reopens completely, it's going to be a bloodbath and deaths everywhere and corpses all over the street and whatever. And none of that happened. Again, the numbers continue to plunge. I'm not kidding. Now, I, even I sometimes think I know Fauci is a respected expert, uh, and, and I, I'm sure he's got some knowledge. So maybe he does have some kind of clever way out of this. I swear to you, his answer was, well, I'm not entirely sure, but maybe they're doing a lot of things outdoors in Texas. <laughs> that was all he could come up with, that all of a sudden, all of Texan society, in, in unison, had all moved outdoors. <laughs> he has no explanation. And I think if you're going to disrupt people's lives like this, you owe us an explanation for these kinds of results. We couldn't get one. Ah, uh, but you know what my, fa my favorite is with some schmuck on Twitter. And I, I spend too much time. Is it obvious already from my talk I spend too much damn time on Twitter? I, I thought I was going to cut back on my Twitter time by taking the Twitter app off my phone. But see, you can still find Twitter in your browser. And somehow I managed to do that. So some guy, I don't know who it was, said, you know, everybody's talking about Florida, but I'm looking at their results and they seem very average to me. I, I mentioned this yesterday in my talk with Matt Kibbe. Florida's results seem very average to him. Now, when Florida opened fully in September 2020, I can tell you as a Florida resident, people were not saying to us in other parts of the country, if Florida reopens, let me warn you, their results are going to be very average. <laughs> no, it was, of course, everyone's going to be dead in Florida if you all open. And now they're reduced to saying, well, the results just look kind of average to me. Like, well, but see, that admits that it worked. I mean, if, if Florida is like pretty much any other random state, then what was it all for? So, all right. Now, I mean, I got, I got like a million of these. I have so many examples. I could just go on and on and regale you with examples. But let's go outside the U.S. a little bit here. Uh, and, and, and let's visit, let me think of a good place. Let's start with Malawi, which I mentioned yesterday. But then I want to get to a couple of other places. So Malawi, last I checked, is literally the poorest country on the face of the earth. Literally the poorest place in the world. And the government was considering locking down Malawi. Now, those people would have been just flat out, outright murderers if they did that. Because in, in a country that poor, you are living hand to mouth. And that means you are earning enough money to eat for that day and survive into the next day. That's it. And if, so therefore, if you don't work day after day after day, week after week, we all know what is surely going to happen. 
But they were, they were on board because apparently all the political elites are saying we need to do this. So they were ready to do it until the people of Malawi rose up and said, excuse my language, ain't no fucking way you're locking us down. And they didn't. And they didn't. The people stopped them. The people. These were people who didn't have the comforts of the first world. They couldn't just sit around and play video games for 18 months. They rose up and it didn't happen. Now, let's talk about Cambodia for a minute. Probably the last thing in the world you'd think, me to, to think that I would mention. But up until March of 2021, Cambodia was reporting zero COVID deaths. Literally none. I don't mean like a few and they rounded it off to zero. Literally zero. Then they had a handful of deaths starting in, in March, but they're still at a rate, a death rate of 30 per million, which is like invisible. It's, it's invisible. Uh, you know, I, I gave you some numbers uh, earlier. California is 1,600. 30 is invisible. So how, how are we supposed to account for this? And they more or less have, you know, it's, life is sort of acceptable in Cambodia, but how did this happen? Now, if, we're, if we believe the Fauci's of the world, it's because the sophisticated public health establishment of Cambodia <laughs> was, was listened to by everybody. Well, I'll tell you something. I'm sure there are a lot of lovely people in Cambodia, but Cambodia was ranked 89th in pandemic preparation. What are the chances? Now, I'm not saying it's zero. You know, occasionally a long shot horse finishes first, you know. What are the chances that the 89th best prepared pandemic country comes out number one? I mean, probably none. Probably none. So maybe what's going on is that, as Jay Bhattacharya of Stanford proposes, maybe pre-existing immunity to this virus is heterogeneously distributed around the world. There are some people who have more immunity than others. Maybe it's not all attributable to government policy. This should be obvious by now. When, there, when it's a factor of like 100 differentiating Cambodia from New York, or at least 80 or 75, that cannot be accounted for by government policy. Something else is going on here. Or likewise in Nepal, oh, that's my favorite one. July of last year, they decided we're not doing this anymore because we just don't want to. We're gonna have big, big gatherings and we just don't care. And they are at 301 deaths per million, 301, which is again like a, a sliver, a fraction of, I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, Belgium or the UK or where, they're all in the 21, 2400, 300 in Nepal. And they're, they're not doing a thing. And their public health establishment is saying, we don't understand it. I mean, it's like they're not even, it's, it's like they think there's no virus. And so they just go out and do whatever they want. We don't understand. Ah, the three most liberating words that we needed to hear so often, but rarely did. We don't understand. That's all you had to say to us. We don't understand. <laughs> but the best example of all, ah, the best example. The best example is Japan. Because all the know-it-alls, they knew what was going to happen in Japan. You remember back in April of 2020, you might not remember this because you're not as much of a fanatic as I am. But believe me, I have followed this like a lunatic for over a year. I, I, like, it's like I can't let this go. It's like, it's like if I were a cold warrior and the Soviet Union collapses, I don't know what I'm going to do now. You know, I, I have nothing else to say. <laughs> so what went on with Japan was in April 2020, people were screaming at them that they hadn't locked down sufficiently because they had very half-hearted lockdown, kind of like more like recommendations, and they, they weren't really doing much of the stuff they're told they need to do. They did a little bit of contact tracing, but not, not like the crazy Western contact tracing where you're, you come in contact with an asymptomatic person and then they're going to quarantine you. They, were, they didn't do any of that. And they said, that's stupid. Uh, and, and so they were being told, oh, you're going to get killed. Your hospitals are going to be overwhelmed with a weird glee. It was a weird glee, wasn't it? Almost like you SOBs are going to get what's coming to you because you didn't listen to the doctor. Fauci's of the world. I hope you die. <laughs> okay. Those are, remember, those are the science ones. Those are the science people. We're the anti-science people. So, so what, what ended up going on there? All right, well, we were told it's all going to be terrible. And then everything turned out okay. And now, as the year went on, it got a little bit worse. But you know what Japan's uh, death rate is? 116. 116. 
any American state would have, would have stabbed its own grandmother in the neck to have 116. <laughs> and no crazy regime of insanity in Japan. So you, you point this out to your friends, and all your friends can come up with is, well, it must be that they wore masks. But in any other situation, you point out countries that are heavily, heavily masked, like the Czech Republic or the Philippines, the most heavily masked country in the world that had massive outbreaks. They say, well, <laughs> you can't fight this virus with just masks. But when it's Japan, since all they did was sort of mask, that's all your friends have. So now suddenly it's, yeah, masking is sufficient, on second thought, masking is sufficient, and that's the explanation for Japan. And so I've seen Eric Topol, one of the great scientists on this question, said Japan did well because the government bought masks for the people and distributed them to them. <laughs> the actual story of that, by the way, is the government sent everybody one mask, and it was child size. Most people couldn't even fit them on. It was a joke. But that's his explanation, because it has to be, we experts know what's right, and the Japanese must have behaved well. Okay, just look at the Japanese subway system and see if you think they were behaving well. <laughs> Unbelievable. So we just keep on being right, and that's very comforting. But the issue now is, how do we, as things kind of wrap up with all this, I don't think we can just declare victory with it, because what if these SOBs try to do this again? You know, we can't let it be, ah, well, because you know when, when Andrew Cuomo lifted restrictions in New York, he said, well, the measures that we implemented that have been proven to be right and proper have allowed us to reopen. Nope, no, no, we are not letting you get away with that. No, because I have enough charts. I have charts that would break the hearts of every one of these people to the point where you could hear the hearts breaking. These charts kill them. So I have friends who are professional filmmakers. Like, they are big time, like, they've helped to make movies you've seen. And they are making a documentary that is going to tell this story. And it's going to have the charts, but not just the charts. It's going to have the human interest stories, the people whose lives were ruined, and their, everything about their existence thrown into turmoil by this. They're going to tell that whole story. They're going to tell it from the heart and from the head. And I think the redirect link, I think it's tomwoods.com slash doc. I donated a lot of money to this project because I'm, I, I don't ask my people to do something that I myself don't do. I, I donated a lot of money to this because after, when you become a crazed fanatic like me, you think this is the most urgent thing right now. And I hope people will consider this. Now, why don't you know who these filmmakers are? Be, you know the answer to that because their lives and careers will be ruined if it came out that they, so they're making this film anonymously. But I know who they are and I can vouch for them. And Joanne Skousen, who runs the Anthem Films and the Anthem Film Festival at Freedom Fest, um, she can vouch for them also. These are real people and they're damn good. And this is a very, this is a very, very important project to get, to get that going. Now, final thing I want to mention is what happens when you talk a lot about this issue. You get a lot more newsletter subscribers, that's for sure. I discovered that. <laughs> and you get a lot more podcast listeners. And this is all, all good things. But some of these people coming on board to read or, uh, or listen to what I have to say, let's just say they're not all libertarians, okay? I mean, they're just, some of them are just regular Americans who think something is not right about this. They don't have a fully thought out political philosophy. Or others of them are conservatives, and they're, you know, they're really good on some things, but then it's like, you know, it's all blue lives matter, and you think, oh, gosh, we were so close, you know, I <laughs> thought we were almost there, you know, uh, or, or, or it's, uh, you know, we got to stand up and salute for such and such military person. Think, oh, no, come on, man, you got to, come on. So I figure, all right, now I got all these people, they like me, they trust that I'm a truth teller, how do I inch them in? to our libertarian craziness has been my strategy. I, I've been wondering about this. How do I get them in there little by little? So let me give you a couple examples of, of how I've managed this. So I've done a number of episodes, more episodes than ever over the past four to five months on Bitcoin than I've ever done in the history of my podcast. And so a lot of these folks don't, you know, they know a little bit about Bitcoin. I had one subscriber write to me and say, well, if you support Bitcoin, I have to unsubscribe because, you know, Bitcoin is used by drug dealers. 
But, wow, I never heard that. Next thing you know, we won't know who's going to build the roads. I never heard that argument before. So I thought, well, this person is not quite ready for the, well, you know, drug dealers provide a valuable service. To society. They're not ready for that. <laughs> so I just wrote and said, well, okay, but I hope you're prepared to stop using the U.S. dollar and bank accounts and air. I mean, you know what? So I got to inch them, you know. So, so the way I've kind of put it to them is, think about the kind of people who don't want you using Bitcoin. And they are the same people who don't want you leaving your house. The same people. These are the people who think that experts should run the society. And of course, they will self-identify. The experts will just emerge spontaneously. The experts will be the ones who are anointed by the state. And we'll know who the experts are because they're on TV all the time. And they really should be making the major decisions. So first, they should tell you how you live your life during COVID, but also they should tell you what kind of money you, you have to use, and they're going to put disabilities on other kinds of money. They're going to be the ones telling you, you what we need is central direction of money in the same way they want to centrally direct this COVID response instead of letting individuals make their own decisions according to circumstances. It's the same kind of mentality. The experts don't like when you make your own decisions. And Oh, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah, gee. Maybe I should consider that. Well, then I went a little, then I, then I got really ambitious. I thought, all right, now I'm going to really leap forward here. I already went into Bitcoin and showing them there's a little bit of an analogy here. What if I talk to them about, what if we don't need the state at all? I, I, I jumped right into that. Because <laughs> that bastard Michael Malice had this unbelievably... Uh, high-selling book, right? Um, uh, the Anarchist Handbook he had. Uh, I'm going to have him on in the relatively near future. We're going to do a whole week on that book uh, when the audio book is ready. Because the audio book, I, I will not um, give away all the, the fun stuff, but he's got some really interesting people he's chosen to read each of the chapters. And one of them, if he gets the person that I want him to get, or, or that I hope he gets... It's just going to blow your mind. But I actually am reading the Rothbard Anatomy of the State chapter. I already did that before I came here, so that's done. But anyway, I said, just, I said, look, this doesn't prove anything. But I just want you to notice the similarity of the rhetorical style of statists and COVID crazies. That they all think that you're helpless without them. That you're a stupid idiot who cannot regulate your own life that the private sector will just kill you. And, but you need these incredible, passionate crusaders for justice in your corner. Like, it's the same rhetoric for everything. So the whole picture, the whole state in general, it's like, you can't survive without Nancy Pelosi. But I think I can. I really do. So again, the thinking was, get them thinking in these productive and helpful ways. But finally... The, the most recent thing I said to them was, and, and this was, here I was gently chiding a few of them. And they're all good sports, so I think they took it in the proper way. I didn't make it appear to be gently chiding. But if you all read what I wrote, you knew I was gently chiding them. I said, now let's step back and look at who in public life, in terms of elected officials, have been the best on COVID. And from what I can see, in the Senate it's Rand Paul, and in the House it's Thomas Massey. Now, early on, I was, I was critical of Rand Paul. I, I didn't like the way he ran his presidential campaign. I didn't like his, some of his... I just... I was critical of him. But, you know, you got to change with changing conditions. And if it weren't for Rand Paul, we wouldn't know any of this stuff about gain-of-function research in Wuhan. You, th you think Mitt Romney is, is going to grill Dr. Fauci? Mitt Romney is going to build a little shrine with roses and incense to Dr. Fauci. So, it's, so I said, notice it's Rand Paul leading the charge on this and, 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 and also ridiculing Fauci, saying, look, you've been vaccinated. You're sitting here in front of us wearing two masks. What's up with that? I mean, like ridiculing him. Good. That's important. And then Thomas Massey, Jesus, he's been good on, on everything, vaccine passports all down the line. And they asked, did you see that clip the other day where they, the reporter asked if he's vaccinated? And he said, first of all, it's none of your business. But secondly, yeah, I will answer the question. 
And, and he says, look, I follow the science. By the way, I have a master's in science from MIT. He says, now, it's not in medicine, but you know what? I know how to read data. And I can, I'm waiting to see that anything I'm going to get from this vaccine is going to give me more robust protection than the natural immunity I get from a natural infection that I had. And he just gave that answer. He didn't hem and haw or squirm or whatever. He just gave that answer. And he's being cheered by all these former tea partiers and all this. And so I said, now, how about that? What do these two men have in common? Yes, I know they both represent Kentucky. But that's incidental. What do they have in common? What they have in common is they both came out of the Ron Paul revolution. Now, what I, what I didn't say, what I didn't say, but what I strongly implied was, remember Ron Paul, the guy you ridiculed as a crank? Well, now all you anti-COVID crazy people, you're all being considered cranks by the establishment. Now you know what it's like to be called a crank. And the guy you called a crank, Ron Paul, on his show, the Ron Paul Liberty Report, has been outstanding on this issue, and all the people you were demanding that we vote for instead have either been invisible or terrible. So maybe there's a lesson in this. Maybe we ought to go back and say, gee, let's, let's think about that guy, Ron Paul. Because he was called a crank not just by uh, some Tea Party voters, but of course by the whole establishment, the political class, all of them. And yet, look at this guy. Here's a guy who would be able to tell us in 2001 on the House floor, recorded, that what's happening right now is the Federal Reserve is trying to cure the dot-com boom by inflating a real estate boom and that this is going to end badly, and Fannie and Freddie's days are numbered, and all these things. He's saying this, and that is exactly what was happening at that time. The regular, normal, free market economy was trying to flash red lights at everybody. Stop doing these dumb, ridiculous things. But the Federal Reserve was turning all those lights green, so everybody kept on keeping on. And the recession of 2001 became the only one in history where housing starts not only didn't fall, they went up. Because everybody was believing, well, housing prices never fall, and a house is the best investment you can make. Because the Fed wasn't, allow wasn't allowing the market to correct itself so people could correct their errors early, rather than persist in them for years and years and years and lead to an even worse crash later. That was what he was talking about. Who, on those debate stages, had the first clue about any of that? I mean, not one, not one. You, know, you think we're going to ask Tim, do you even remember who Tim Pawlenty is? Does anybody remember who that guy is? Absolute empty suit. He was governor of Minnesota. As empty a suit as, as could be. And as one of those debates was starting, Sean Hannity began the coverage by saying, well, tonight, all eyes are on Tim Pawlenty. <laughs> Speak for yourself, you creep. Tim Pawlenty. He has nothing interesting to say. I know everything he's going to say already. It's all based on talking points or whatever. No one has gone back and said, you know, at a time like this, we better check in and see where Rick Santorum stands on lockdowns. <laughs> no one. It was Ron Paul who had the guts to be different, to, to say, I want to talk about the Federal Reserve, even though there's no focus group that tells me I need to talk about it, just because I think it's urgently necessary for the public to know about it. Or he's the guy who said, yeah, this war in Iraq's a total fiasco, and, it's gonna and all these things are going to happen. Every single one of them happened, and now it's kind of fashionable. Everybody said, well, I didn't vote for that, or maybe I did, but I don't remember why, or something. Like, and everybody's backing away. And so the guy just keeps on being right and right and right. Or he's also the guy, yeah, you might not agree with every position that he has, but you've got to respect a guy who goes down to Florida and tells Cuban-Americans we need free trade with Cuba because that's the morally correct position. He knows he's going to lose votes for that, but he's got to tell the people that. Or he goes to South Carolina and says, yeah, we got to, we got to lift uh, all the drug law. I mean, I'm talking not just about weed. You know, there are some candidates who just want to know, I'm really edgy because I'll talk about weed. I'll talk about any damn drug you want to talk about. And I say that whatever drug it is, if you know somebody who's really abusing it and really in trouble, do you really think the best solution to that problem for that person you love is prison rape? <laughs> because that's what you're going to get under the current regime. He goes to South Carolina, the most reddishy red state of all, and says that to them. 
Now, you would think if there were any decency in the world, people would say, wow, I disagree with that profoundly. But when was the last time a candidate had the guts to tell me something I didn't want to hear, to tell me the opposite of, of what I wanted to hear, and doesn't even seem to care? You know, that is a, that's the kind of guy who, when COVID comes along and all the respectables band together, that's the kind of guy who will be the lone man saying, no, we're not doing this. And what makes me happy is that despite being horrified at how many people around the world either went along with this out of passive resignation or even, heaven forbid, actively cheered on what was done to us, there's a core of people out there that no matter how many names you call them, no matter how much you try to intimidate them, no matter how nasty and rotten you are, no matter how they try to isolate you and ostracize you, there's that core of people that will refuse to be silenced and ostracized, that when the time comes, will stand up and be counted. And yet, yeah, it may sound melodramatic, but it's true. Those people are right here in this room, and I am so glad to be part of what we're all doing together. Thank you.